if you're spending a million dollars a month on Google Ads and you do not have measurable ROI on those programs, there should be alarms going off all over the company. Everyone should know about it. How is that type of stuff able to happen for years at a time with measurably low ROI, untenable ROI on these channels with huge amounts of money and nobody in the company knows? And it's because the analytics that companies use and the way that they are focused on defending their budget versus making the right strategic choice for the business, that's the reason that we don't have the visibility into these things that we need to have. We have had uh, some awesome episodes of this show the past like three, four, five weeks. The participation has been great. The topics have been very like narrow and focused. The people that listen to it afterwards are getting tons of value based on the questions that you all have. Like I set the table, prevent some, present some information, but then you all are able to say, hey, that didn't really make sense to me. Or could you go a little bit deeper here? Or here's the specifics of my situation. How do we apply this concept to my situation? And that is the gold that gets you the unlock for what you're trying to do. And also for all the people that are either on this or, or somewhere else are able to learn something as we get more contextual and into the details. So um, let's keep it up. Let's have this continue to be an awesome event. Um, looking forward to diving into it. The thing, uh, and we've talked about uh, we almost in every episode of what we do here, we talk some form of like operations, whether you call that marketing operations or revenue operations or sales ops. We're talking about data and technology and analytics and planning and modeling. We talk about all those things. So um, that's going to be the core concept of this episode. I'm reluctant to say that this episode is about RevOps because I think that RevOps is generally misunderstood. Um, I think that, and I remember, I actually attend when I started my company in 2019. I attended an event in Boston, and the event was all about RevOps. And what was it? It was a group of technology vendors like Lean Data and other ones that were basically pushing this concept of centralized, holistic operations into the market around the technology that they sold, which is lead to account matching and other things like that. Um, and I think that as we've seen in practice, I think that there's a variety of ways that companies like implement the operations functions inside of their company. Some companies will have uh, inside of the department. So the marketing ops team will report into the CMO and the sales ops team or what many would call the rev ops team, which is really sales ops rebranded, would report into the VP of sales or chief revenue officer. And then maybe they have, you know, for some companies have one or a handful of people in what they would call customer success operations or customer operations or something like that. So one structure is to have distributed functions inside of those functions. And uh, to be clear, there's no right or wrong answer here. There are just there are different ways that companies have tried it. And then there are pros and cons to those approaches. Um, other companies have tried a centralized function. They call it RevOps. And then they put it under the chief revenue officer. Some companies put it under the COO. Other companies put it under the CFO. And they have a centralized function where the CMO doesn't have dedicated ops people. And then they have to basically submit a ticket or get into some queue or try to figure out how to you know, work the politics to get their initiatives on the docket to actually get done. Um, and uh, And... What I hear from many companies that take on a, a centralized version of RevOps means that all the priorities and all the work are ad hoc stuff related to the sales department. Build me these random reports. Um, here, we need to work. We need to redo our forecast. Let's figure out how to like administer our compensation plan, all these different things related to sales. And then the things that you know, quote unquote, marketing is pushing that actually benefit the entire go to market team do not become priorities do not get prioritized do not get worked on to the extent that some companies are hacking together the craziest solutions for in the marketing department to get something done because they can't get the actual company to get it done the right way. So they have to like build, hire a firm and build custom software to get the analytics that they think that they need because their own team won't do it. Um, and so these, these different setups 
inside of revenue operations create different pros and cons about how the function operates. Um, I posted last week and talked about how in, in uh, you know, I get a lot of reports specifically about marketing leaders about how they can't get anything done with a, with a centralized RevOps function. And many people took that as I was criticizing the talent and the aptitude of RevOps people. That is entirely not what I'm doing. I'm challenging the setup that companies use and how they try and get core things done and how RevOps has evolved to this point, which is basically take all of this random important stuff, often that has conflicting and competing objectives and throw it into one big bucket and call it RevOps, um, which is basically what's happened. How can we expect the same people that are going to be implementing campaigns inside of Salesforce and running our email automation and implementing our tools to also think about the forecasting and modeling for the company, the KPIs that we should measure and things like that. And so I believe that over time, we're going to have to see some level of separation. Many people talk about it as separating strategy from technical and tactical. I basically see it as you have a go-to-market strategy, which may not be a function or a department. It might be an individual contributor that works with the key executives, CFO, CEO, CRO, people like that. Um, and then you'll have a RevOps department that is responsible for implementing all of those different things. And then the priorities are set in a different way. Um, one thing that I wanted to call out specifically around the idea of like, I'm, I'm definitely not criticizing the talent or aptitude of these people. These are very talented people. They do a lot of important work. They usually don't get recognized for that work. I think a lot of the core issue around quote unquote, like marketing revenue operations right now is that every single company is reinventing the wheel every time. There is no set foundation. There are no like core ways to go about it. Every company names their properties different. Every company tracks things different. Every comp they, they start from scratch and then are reliant on the experience and the talent of a couple key people that they have in their company to hope that they're doing it up to the best practice. Now, I want to look at how other departments in the organization would do this, okay? Let's look at the sales department. When you are booting up a new sales organization or you're scaling a sales organization, what's the first thing that you do? You adopt a sales methodology so that you have a starting point and a foundation so that everyone is operating across the same thing. You start somewhere. Let's talk about software development. Software developers don't build the like code the login page from scratch anymore. There are SDKs for that. People have already built the code for the login page and other features. So they grab that stuff, they implement it from somebody else as a core standard, and then they build custom for their company on top of it. Let's talk about finance. Finance has a clear way to that the PL is structured. There are gap accounting principles around it. Nobody in finance is reinventing the wheel about what belongs as an expense and what belongs in COGS or not. All that stuff is set. And so why, when we think about our CRM data architecture, arguably the most important thing in our business in order to be able to scale and grow efficiently, are we building from scratch and relying on the core talent of experience of a couple of core people? Why are we not using a core foundation and data standards and things like that? And I'm not the only one talking about this. Winning by Design is a firm, go-to-market partners. There are many companies out there that are evangelizing having a common foundational set of data that is tracked in the same way so that you're able to accurately compare your data to somebody else's that your PE firm doesn't need to guess about what you're talking about when you say a term that when you mention a term in your go to market team meeting that a SDR manager and the CMO both know what it actually means. Um, and I feel like that is actually the root of the issue in RevOps is that we need a foundational thing that everybody operates on, that the company understands, that the executive team understands, that then we can customize and build on top from there that meet the requirements and needs of our business. Historically, that used to be, you know, David, back in the day, we're definitely going to talk about this in this episode. Historically, that used to be MQL, SQL, SQO1, inquiry, SQL, MQL, and further down. That's what it used to be. That model simply breaks when you try and operate as an integrated go-to-market team instead of an assembly line of siloed departments. And so we need a new methodology of how we think about that that then creates the standard of why we would have the data standards in the first place. Another thing that I want to talk about is like, while many companies will call it revenue operations, it is not a holistic function. 
Revenue operations continues to evaluate things in silos. And then, and it's not the fault of RevOps, it's the fault of how the company silos the departments and then uses that departmental level structure to scrutinize the investments of those departments. And the idea that if your sales win rates are low or your SDR connect rates are terrible and your conversion rates are terrible, that hiring a sales trainer or firing your sales leader is generally not the answer. It's fixing your fucking marketing. And if you don't look at things holistically and you don't see across the whole field, then you end up doing things that are micro optimizations for a department like SDRs rather than transformational change across the entire go to market. This is a call because there are people that are in revenue operations that do this right now. I think that there are a few, but there are that many other people in that department could also do that. But many people that come from other parts of the org, SDR manager, demand gen leader, you know, even even a, a sales manager, those types of people actually could have a lot of the core skills to do this job as well. Um, and I feel like it's just an unfilled role in B2B companies. So what happens uh, in in many companies, if you have a great CMO, the CMO takes that role. CMO will say, I own all pipeline, I'm accountable to all pipeline, I don't care if it's marketing influenced or marketing sourced or where it comes from. My job is to deploy investments to hit a pipeline target for our company, not think about my department. Great CMOs will do that. Um, if not, it becomes a committee. It becomes each individual leader of that department, you got the CMO, the CRO, and other people all vying, all trying to defend their budget, all trying to go and get more budget, all sort of competing against one another rather than working together and, and being able to make decisions as a team using data. And I have to say that I think that we are not seeing what we need out of this function in terms of pushing our organization forward in how we think about KPIs and attribution and things like that. Sure, they're great at implementing what are currently considered best practices. They can do that. They can install visible. They can set up your W-shaped model. They can do, you know, they can high build, do that type of stuff. But at some point, we have to say, is this even the right thing to be looking at right now? Because I interact with tons of companies that use a W or a U-shaped model with visible. And they spend a ton of money on things that are clearly not working because the model allows that type of stuff to happen. And the top level analytics inside of the go-to-market team, like if you're... If you're spending a million dollars a month on Google Ads and you do not have measurable ROI on those programs, there should be alarms going off all over the company. Everyone should know about it. The CFO should be able to flag it very easily. The CEO should know. And definitely the CMO should know. And why, how is that type of stuff able to happen for years at a time with measurably low ROI, untenable? ROI on these channels with huge amounts of money, and nobody in the company knows. And it's because the analytics that companies use and the way that they are focused on defending their budget versus making the right strategic choice for the business. That's the reason that we don't have the visibility into these things that we need to have. Um, I'm, uh, I consistently uh, am surprised that there is not more pressure coming from the finance department around some of the stuff that's happening in marketing consistently surprised how that stuff is is getting by because you like even the marketing reports that get put in the board decks are showing that the stuff is bad but nobody is actually taking that and making any changes around it and so these are just things that again all i do with you is i work with a ton of companies I don't talk about one instance of one company. I wait till I see consistent patterns of how many companies do it. And when I found that, especially in SaaS and tech, the market is so homogenous around how they do these things that if I look at five companies and all five companies are doing it, then that means probably 90% of companies are all doing the same thing. Um, and so these are some of the things that I'm seeing on the ground related to ops. I think we really need to divide the idea of who decides what we're doing and why versus how we're doing or what or how we're going to do it. Right now, RevOps is responsible for all those decisions sometimes. So what happens? The short term needs, the tactical, the ad hoc, the company centric things, the politics, that's what get, gets prioritized in that department. And we need to have a 
you know, a strategy, a strategist, a, a committee, however you, you want to set it up, that's responsible for what are our key strategic initiatives related to operations? Why are these our strategic initiatives? How should they be prioritized? And then who's going to do them? Companies think just because they have a RevOps department that ev all the work that's important in the company has to flow through that department. Smart companies recognize that if you want to make a transformational change or you have a key strategic initiatives and project, that bringing that in an outside firm dramatically increases the probability of success of that project. And I'm not here promoting my company for that reason. That's what CMOs tell me. They say if we're trying to make a transformational change that we have to bring in, its, in marketing and sales in anywhere in the organization – that we bring in an external firm because they're going to push a timeline, they're going to deliver on time, they're going to increase the probability of success, they're going to help us see around corners. Um, so thinking that, oh, you know, we are we have two marketing operations people on our team already, we don't need to hire an outsourced for, firm. Well, I just think that you sh that some of those things should be rethought. Um, and so with all that said, I hope there's some fodder in there to actually have some key questions. Um, maybe you all have certain experiences that are different than than the things that I'm seeing. I would love to hear that stuff as well. would love to have an open dialogue about, you know, where this function is at, whether the challenges are, the opportunities, things that are working and not. So uh, we'll pass it over to uh, to the audience for questions or, or different sentiments. Thanks, everyone, for being here. All right. We've got the best. OG back for the first question of the episode, which is David. Okay. Hi. Been a while. Um, glad to be back. So much of what you said, I absolutely agree with. There are so many different ways this could be done. There's no one particular way that it is going to fit for, for everyone. And every different size company is going to have different challenges because of the size of the data and the processes they need to have. But are there some standard core measures? that you would suggest that all RevOps teams should be enabling, if at first I suppose you enable, and then tracking so that they can be reporting the core business values, if you will, to the company. So as you point out, no company seems to have the same set of fields, the same set of pick lists or anything. One way perhaps to steer things towards a more common direction as you did with Hero Pipeline, is to perhaps say, well, these are the core me measurements that you ought to be measuring. And first, you're going to have to capture the data to enable it, and then you'll be able to report on it. So we might guess what they are, but if someone was to step out and propose something, perhaps the rest of us would follow. You know how that works, right? David, you read my mind. Well, um, just, so it's for it's forthcoming. We're not quite there yet, but we've gotten a lot of reps with companies and we continue to test out core things and find micro holes in the model. And we expect by the end of March that that will be available. At this point, we have defined 57 core things that companies should track. Really. And then so that's one thing. What are we going to track? We've we we have 57 core things that a company should track. The next thing is how you track it. Um, and we believe that the way the structure of how it's tracked right now of taking information from a lead and then it converts to a contact and then it converts to you got activities attached to it and you have campaign members attached to the contact and then it's, you know, connected to the account and then all of a sudden you have opportunities in that account that it's a total fucking mess um, and that how it's actually tracked needs to change too. Um, to create a container of information that includes all the core data across those objects for for clear reporting, what we call a pipeline architecture, which will basic what we believe will be a basically the gap accounting principles or the easy button for an operations team to have a foundational set of data collected and tracked in the right way that then they can build custom for their business on top of it. Um, so that's part of like it's what to track and then how to actually track it. But then even downstream from that, it's how to analyze it. And so we had a project with a, with a company over the past four or six weeks where um, they're, they're using a W-shape visible model, but sometimes they use a U-shape. And, and then we applied the way that we look at the data, and we actually applied three different ways that we could look at the data because the da they have data stored of which department and credit and where it should go on five different properties. 
And so there has to be like some type of logic to sort of sort through all this different stuff. And the crazy thing is, so we looked at the data four different ways, and each way we looked at it told an entirely different story. And so in that instance, how you look at the data actually becomes a key, critical, important thing. Um, and I think that that is also generally misunderstood, where a company will use a, uh, a model like a visible that'll take the contacts that are associated with an opportunity and then look at the all the touch points around all of those contacts and then try and divide the credit against the ARR. And so what does that incentivize you to do? Get a ton of contacts, get a bunch of trackable touch points, then hope sales closes the deal. Um, and what it does is it artificially inflates the impact of all the things that are easy to track. Um, and so the, the having the standard is something that I'm definitely working on. Winning by Design, I think, has made good progress on that with their like conversion rates between the stages and the, and the bow tie framework that they have. Uh, but generally, our, posi our position is that it's just in insufficient to measure net new acquisition that just looking at you know demand creation demand capture uh, you know buyer research and selection as like a stage process not breaking down things by hero not looking at pipeline sources not really considering signals not considering all that other data that impacts the velocity and the productivity of sales it's just inadequate right now um, and so we're basically building additional things that I think companies will leverage for net new acquisition to be able to really understand that part of it. Winning by Design has a great framework for sales and account account management expansion. I think many companies should consider that. Um, but we're building a what we think is a much more granular, specific, important model of how we think about an integrated go-to-market team related to acquiring net new business as well as expanding. Our model will support expansion as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um Sometimes it helps to have a guiding light, like this is what we're aiming for, and now we'll figure out how to get there, right? So many times in our CRM systems, we're capturing data because we think that's the right thing to be capturing right now. And then afterwards, we create the reporting, and then we discover we want to report something different that we, than we have. And so we go back and, it's just, and create the data by adding the field or adding the pick list or whatever it is. But if one were to start with your brand new fresh instance in a new company and say, these are the, I guess, 57 core, which is a mind blowing and scary number. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, most of them are set on. Actually, I think all of them are set automatically. Okay. So it just runs in the background. So a number of core measures to be tracking. And here, and here is the data that you're going to need to, to be able to calculate that measure so that it kind of forces you in a particular direction, we'd all be much better off if we started out kind of walking down the right path rather than kind of doing the, the crooked mile for a, you know, a crooked pathway and eventually find our way there. So anyway, whether the 57 turn out to be 52 or 75, um, and even if a company can only implement half of them because of perhaps the nature of what they are, it would be a, it would be a start in the right direction and a and a great help to not just the ops teams, but the rest of the management team using the results from the ops teams. So thank you. Yeah, I'll give you a, a very easy example for everyone here related to, to marketing, okay? So uh, in theory, we need to be collecting both of these data points. We need to be collecting the signal. What did the buyer do? Did they submit a demo, download an ebook, visit our website anonymously? What was the signal? And then at the same time connected, we need to be knowing where did they come from, the channel? Do they come from Google paid search? What keywords, what campaigns, organic search, a referral from a review site vendor? They clicked on an email that our SDR sent. We need to know both where they came from and what they did. A lot of companies, many companies, blend those two things together. So they look at AdWords performance and demo performance with the same data field. And it's the and then you really can't do anything with that because they're two entirely different things. Um, other companies will um, will have them split out 
so that they can see, okay, we get this many demos, we have this many pricing requests, we have this many of this, but then they don't collect the camp the campaign information. So 71% of the people that filled out a demo or a pricing request, they have no idea where they came from. And in either of those cases, it makes it incredibly hard to understand what's working and what's not to deploy investments to forecast and model in the future. So that's just one easy example from a marketing lens of a way that uh, a consistent place where companies fall fall down by not having like a framework or a best practice to start with. Thanks, David. Really appreciate you being here, man. Good to see you. We've got, I got a DM question because someone's eating lunch. So this is from Michael. Um, he wanted to follow up on your comment around finance being accessing the same reports and looking at marketing in the same way. So how did you how would you educate your CS, CFO to look at investments by capture demand channels and what will show up in certain reports and what well essentially he's nervous that the CFO won't really get all of the investments with the reporting that they have access to now. How much did we spend on marketing and SDRs? How much pipeline did we create that quarter? It's as simple as that. That's what the CFO needs to know. And frankly, the marketing team should be looking at that as the pro one of the primary indicators as well. So it's not about teaching our CFO around how a W-shaped attribution model works. It's about changing both what the marketing team report and what the CFO is looking at to level, level up and look at it as a holistic go-to-market team and be able to quickly, easily identify where we are not achieving the core goals with the investments that we're deploying, and that everybody in the company, including the people that hold the budget for those investments, all know it. And that's what we're missing right now. When things are not, when things are missing, the company sees, okay, we're not hitting our plan, but then every single department then digs in and tries to prove that what they're doing is working. And we must, especially as business leaders go in to things with the not only the lens actually most often not the lens of how do we prove what we're doing is working and much differently say what are the results in the business if the things in the business aren't working then i need to go into my budget and realize what is not working and i need to be looking at what's not working in my budget not trying to prove that everything is working and we just need we need to be looking at the data with different questions sometimes based on the top level business performance. It is undeniable that if you are spending $10 million on marketing investments and delivering $10 million in pipeline, i.e. a $1 one-to-one -one return in pipeline, which means that you have a four-year marketing CAC payback at best, that if that is happening, that it's clear that most of that $10 million is ineffective. And then we need to be looking as a marketing leader, understand what parts of this are ineffective and how am I going to make the changes to reallocate? That's an extreme example. It's usually not that bad, but the math was easy. Um, and I just don't think that we're spending enough time answering, like looking at those questions as marketing leaders right now. Um, and so it's just a little bit of a, a mindset switch in how you are looking at it. And I found that... Um, the finance team has like their own stuff that they're looking at over here. And sometimes I wish that the marketing team would look at it too and to be able to see what is our finance team looking at? How are they looking at it that way? What can I learn from how they look at the data? Um, I think that especially when it comes to like, you know, VP and up in marketing, that a lot of the work is going to become FP&A work, collaborating with finance and being capable of understanding those things and speaking that language with them. When you hold and deploy millions of dollars in budget, you have to be able to think like that. Um, and I really like the frame of not thinking about it as budget or ad spend or something like that. It's an investment. We are responsible for deploying investments and getting a return. We, we should be thinking about it as if it's our own money that we're putting our million dollars a month into Google search. We have to be scrutinizing it as if it's our own money and making changes and reporting back to the company as if it's our own money. We need a lot more fiscal responsibility for the people that deploy that, that, those large sums of money. You answered that very in-depth with some key takeaways. So awesome. We're going to switch to Danielle. I'm going to bring her on live. She has a question about channels. First to like piggyback on what you were just saying, I've tried to work with the finance director and it, you know, sometimes an organization doesn't allow that, which is super frustrating where it's like, hmm. hey, how much I think we should spend. 
what did we actually spend? What did we get out of it? And you just have no visibility. And that's, that's a top down thing. But yeah, that's too bad. I've actually seen this is more for everyone else listening. But I've seen that some companies now are placing like an FP&A lead in the marketing team, that they don't report to the marketing leader, but they're basically an embedded FP&A person for marketing. Sample size is small. But uh, you know, I think it's a smart thing that that these other companies are trying to sort of connect uh, close those gaps and connect the departments. When there are leads that come from multiple channels, how do you report on that? I actually used your um, your revenue reporting model, and I reported, I like put it all together, and that was where we kind of got stuck. Is like, okay, this person went to an event, they also filled out this form on the website, they also attended a webinar, and then four months later, they called us and said, "Hey, we want to be a client. What do you do with that?" Yeah, that this isn't, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not an alternative or like, a, it's not multi touch attribution, which is put it that way. That what we're looking for here and in your example, that would be the customer called us, that would be the signal. And then we would automatically try and look back in the data and the track to be able to see within a short period of time before that call if there was something that happened that we could assume triggered the inbound phone call. Maybe we sent them an email and they opened it and then they went in there and clicked the phone number in the email and you'd be able, you could probably do most of that digitally with the tools available, but that's what we're thinking about. And that's like the the main dimension and the reason is because depending on what that person does, where they came from and what they did will predict everything downwards, how they convert from an SDR into a meeting, whether that meeting becomes qualified, and even more so, uh, even downstream from qualified to win. All those stuff will have patterns based on the thing the buyer does right before they engage, what we call a signal. It's not a replacement for trying to understand all the other things that are happening before that. And so we we want to be able to be able to have the insights to know they came to this webinar, maybe they attended it a bunch of times, we sent them some emails. I, I per personally question the tangible value of all of those touch points, my one person's opinion, but I just question it. The reason being is that uh, there's two points. So first off, like when you think about a like mapping a customer journey with a multi-touch attribution software, the core things to recognize is that it only is showing you the trackable engagement the person has with your company. So it's missing that all the stuff that they do with other vendors, it's missing all the things they do that aren't trackable. It's missing all the things they do with peers and events and third parties that don't pass you that data. It just gives you it's it's valuable. I'm not going to question that you can do stuff with it. But it's just a very incomplete picture of what's actually happening. I think it leads people to some of the wrong conclusions because they don't they're not able to deduce the bigger picture. Um, and so like I continue and I've been challenging it for so long because it drives so many behaviors of what is the value of first touch attribution? What you you got someone into your database? Cool. Like they close four years later, who cares? And to wait to use a W shaped attribution model and say the way that they got into our database deserves 30% of the credit is just so out of whack. And what it does is it drives all the marketing investments to just build up a database so they have first touch attribution that they hope eventually that contact gets attached to an opportunity and closes and you can just game the whole system. Um, and so it because theoretically, you could look at all of your accounts and all of your TAM and go into a database and put everyone in the database. And all of a sudden, first touch attribution doesn't matter at all. Um, and so those are, I think, as I poke, poke some of the holes in, in the in the, some of the ways that I see it done right now, f purely for the reason that I just see it not not working for companies like um, it'll, it'll use some of those like it'll it'll for force you to use or incentivize you to use a channel in the wrong way to get the touch point to appease the attribution model. Instead of using the channel in the right way and the way that your customer wants it to be used in order to get a better outcome for the company. But instead, we want to, ins you know, prioritize getting a trackable touch point, because that's what we're in our model incentivizes. Um, you can look across like any, any human behavior, um, outside of just B2B anything, the thing, the way that we are measured or the way that we measure ourselves or the way that somebody else is measuring and incentivizing us directly drives the behavior. 
And so whenever I think about how is this company being measured, the first place that my brain goes is how can I game this metric? Not to say that everyone's trying to do that, but it helps me think about where are all the holes in this model and what would I do as a marketer to make, to move this metric without it making any impact for the business. And the reality is that many ways that companies measure marketing right now, there are a lot of ways that you can move the numbers and appease the model without making much of a tangible impact for customers or the company. That was a huge rant. I don't even really remember the, the beginning of your question, but would love, like, I just said a lot of stuff. And uh, like sometimes I say these things for the reaction, right? Like, I'm not even really talking about feeling like I'm right or not in this case. I more want to understand, like, I'm putting things out there. I want to see how you and other people on the call react. Well, I, I think it's interesting. What I'm kind of gathering then is, um, so the question was, how do you deal with multiple channels, right? So mm -hmm. it kind of sounds like what you're saying is, the last thing that they did, the last channel or last signal was maybe the most impactful. Um, For that part it, of the process. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I said this. Following like what you're saying of just asking them too. And so I think when you ask them, what was the most impactful thing? Maybe that should take more account for more. Than here's the, yeah. Here's the insight is that B2B companies are trying to build a whole building with one tool. They just take a hammer and they try and like they should be having a screwdriver and a concrete mixer and a hammer and all this stuff. But instead, they're sitting there trying to build a high rise building just with a hammer. That's what they do with with multi touch attribution. Um, and so we need to recognize that multi touch attribution, the hammer is very good at hitting in a nail, i.e. measuring digital trackable touch points and being able to identify those things. But we also need the screwdriver to understand what are all the things that are not trackable that generally are making a huge impact on how customers hear about us and want to eventually get in market to buy and do independent research and buying that doesn't get tracked. And then once accounts are in pipeline, like how, what can we do in a marketing, digital air cover, field marketing events, some references, social proof, all that type of stuff. What can we do to convert that pipeline? If you're using a W-shaped model against pipeline creation, then you would never invest there. And it's like a great place to invest to drive short-term revenue and help the company. Um, and so I think it's just about, as a business, recognizing that we need multiple tools that are purpose-built to be able to deliver on certain things that we need. Um, and that one measurement model is never going to account for everything. And I hear this all the time. S some of the smartest people I know come to me and say, Chris, we are having so much trouble measuring the top of the funnel. What tool should we buy? And it's just not a tool. It's not. Maybe eventually some people will figure out how to scale qualitative customer research and bring that all in to understand what happens at the top of the funnel. But right now it's a lot manual stuff. Um, and so it's just about, I think, and then, um, from a marketing perspective that if you look at the entire marketing budget and say that the hundred percent of the budget is used to create pipeline, you're just doing the company a disservice that part of the budget should be to create demand. Part of it should be capture intent. Part of it should be to convert pipeline and part of it should be to expand accounts. And then each of those budgets should be scrutinized in a different way based on the objective of the investment. And so if you just say we spend 10 million in marketing and we're going to measure that entire 10 million against pipeline creation, then why as a marketing leader would you invest in your user conference? Why as a marketing leader would you invest in field dinners that are going to help your sales team win big deals? Um, and we just need to be able to set up the right investment analytics uh, to be able to evaluate investments based on the purpose and objective of the investment. I think that's we're working on that. We're not there yet, clearly, as you can hear, as I think. So I think theoretically and philosophically, this is the right way to move. But what I need to do over the next couple of months is really figure out how do we make this practical? How do we allow people to be able to actually use these principles, to have the tools, to be able to educate other people in the company that need to know? Um, my hope is that given sort of my background that I'm able to break through with finance leaders and the way that we look at things is more effective and getting finance on board than some of the things that, that we're doing right now. Um, so that's my, it's really about picking out the different parts and then having a different process to evaluate those, uh, the investments that go to those parts. So for instance, like a company 
that you know runs three million. You know, let's just do for sake of round numbers, ten million dollars a year in Google Ads. Um, and when they report, they say we get two dollars in pipeline for every dollar we spend on Google, which means they get twenty million in pipe on ten million in spend, and are going to get you know two to three million dollars in revenue on it. So they spent ten million; they're going to get two or three million, which is not a good ROI. But they're not even that's that's twenty five percent of the process potentially that you're not even accounting for all the investments that we made to create that demand and all downstream all the investments that we made to convert that pipeline into revenue, and all of a sudden you're over there celebrating because we have a twenty four month CAC payback on Google and we feel like it's good, but you're excluding all the other costs that happen from the beginning of the customer life cycle to the end, and when you add them all up quickly, your twenty four month CAC payback from a Google ad investment turns into a sixty month CAC payback when you add in all the other costs. Um, and so, I think we need to be looking and and looking at those indivi- uh, processes individually and recognize that we have multiple investments that need to happen that are across the go-to-market team, not just marketing, our sales resources, our SDRs, the operations professionals, all the technology that we buy and deploy, the cost of the data that we buy. Um, There's just a lot of expenses outside of the working dollars in marketing that go into getting a customer. I'm fired up today. I really am. All right. Yes. We are on a roll. The chat (laughs) is on a roll as well. Um, (laughs) I think one of the big takeaways I just wanted to make sure was very clear is that signals are not multi-touch attribution. They're two separate things. And a person in an account is going to have multiple signals over their life cycle at different times. And the, the goal is just to understand what signal caused your sales team to reach out and then measure the outcome of that signal so you know how to prioritize these signals moving forward. So um, that's all I'm going to say on that. And we will go to the next question. Great clarification. Thank you. Okay. We have Ted up. We've got a lineup here. So we are going to bring Ted up for his question. Hey, Chris. Um, Appreciate all of the uh, insight that you gave us, but I'm going to pivot a little bit. So hopefully it's not too big of a pivot. All good. Um, So I once heard you say a while ago, Uh, it was a clip, marketing can't save a shitty product. Meaning, like, for example, a commodity service provider that's just a low-level player. Um, And so, like, right now, that's kind of my journey. uh, If I'm being quite frank, hopefully my boss isn't on this call. Um, And so, um, right now, we're crushing it on on our domain capture. Like, truly, we're looking at our domain capture like we can't, we don't know how, and we're pretty satisfied of, with how we're doing. So now that we're looking at more of the top of the funnel um, and investing in that performance, um, and I suppose this would be a demand creation just for the category because it is a commodity. Uh, but here's like uh, here's the catch. So our subject matter expert, our SME, like wouldn't actually recommend our shitty product. Um, again, I hope my boss doesn't hear this because it's, I, I gotta be raw and ask the question because it's the hard thing to figure out is, um, how would, how, how should a company approach this where the SME actually would not recommend this shitty product? Um, and then here I am trying to be a decision maker on investing on this top of the funnel where we're trying to. Uh, at least create demand for the category. Um, and then when this SME is rolling and talking and uh, is actually getting ears and getting attention, it's turning out that he being fully uh, in a state of mind of, I want to help this business, is now moving them in the opposite direction of the product for the company. So this mm-hmm. is kind of like the pickle um that I'm in and I'm interested to get your take on it. Yeah, the first thing I was going to ask is, is it really that the product is shitty or that you're just a low level player in a commodity category? But you kind of already answered that. I'm going to if you're a low level player in a commodity category, then just and you want to just assume that position, then like oftentimes you can build a 10, 50 million dollar business, a like a life changing business for an entrepreneur and some of the people that work there 
just riding on the back of the demand created by all the main category players neither niching down or having one feature or use case that's better that's not really your situation it sounds like so in this situation i was consulting on a company yesterday somebody told me the exact same thing um, what they said, and they're not in the ABM category, but they said, you know, in the ABM category, you kind of have demand base and six cents and zoom info. And then you got terminus, like we're terminus. That's what they said. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Um, and, and so what I said back to, to them, and this is biz, this isn't really marketing strategy anymore. This is business strategy that maybe you're the terminus or you're the, you're the shitty player to a majority of the market but you can win somewhere. And so when you are a, a player like that in the space, the real strategy is to niche down, is to niche down, to focus on a specific customer industry vertical use case, and then to over time build a product for them that's better than the product that goes horizontal across a bunch of different industries because it's more specific. Like that's the business strategy if you're in that in that case or to sell the revenue to another company and move on and do something else. Um, but in your case, you're saying demand capture is working for us. Like if demand capture is working and driving pipeline and revenue, then sometimes it's hard for me to believe that you really have that shitty of a product. Yeah, so I labeled it, I label it shitty, um, more so connecting it to the business goals, uh, meaning like there isn't a unique value proposition. Like the the customers that we attract, they are attracted to the attributes that make us a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, if I could like put a label on it, they just need a guy to do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so when it comes to, when it comes to like a unique value proposition, it's absent. Um, but then also again, our, our SME, um, it's kind of twofold. There's that part. And then the SME is still um, still on this place to say, like, if if he is speaking about what is in the best interest of the businesses that we attract, um, he would recommend not buying our product. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's a separate issue. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a separate issue. And it's it's um, it's interesting when these things are already in flight because like it's different than starting it from the ground. It's starting from the ground up. Like the principles of starting it from the ground up, identify a core market need, build a strategy around a differentiated solution and position, and then go out and, and build against an unmet, unmet need with a differentiated solution. Like that's the, that's the, that's the core business strategy. Now, many technology companies do not do that. They take a technology and then they try and force fit it into a market or they find a market that's already growing and they just try and get in there and ride the wave and they try and have a, a micro or you know medium sized exit in a popular booming category. Um, so the the like core foundational principle of identifying unmet need, develop a diff, uh, unmet need in a specific, you know, target market and then develop a, a differentiated solution, you can do that at any point. You can continue to run the business operations the way it is. And you can also go out in the market, talk to all your happiest customers and your best customers, understand what they want, understand what they prioritize. And over time, build a more differentiated solution through product marketing and product management and strategy. Um, and so those are a couple of the angles of which you could approach it. But this is not like, this is not a thought leadership issue. This is not um, it's really like, a it's a business strategy issue. And that was the point of that post, really. It's that if you don't have, like, I like working with companies that are 50, 100 plus million in revenue, because at that point, it's clear the product isn't shitty. That variable is out of the equation. So then it's just about how good are you at telling people about your product and having a product and a message that resonates with people to get more people in and then how many of your happy customers tell other people and how efficiently can you do that while you deploy investments to make it happen. I love working in a company like that because the product variable is out of the equation, which is different than when you're two, five, even 10 million ARR, um, where no matter what, in those cases, sometimes no matter what you do in marketing, that it's not gonna it's not gonna make the impact that it could at a company that has that type of traction. Um, so to me, it's really about distilling inside of the business, 
what is the business or the go, business or go to market issue? Do we have a product that people don't want? Can we not get people to understand the product? Can we not get people to be aware of it? When they want to buy it, do we suck and we like push them away for some reason? Once they're a customer, do we suck at onboarding and all of them leave and tell everyone how shitty we are? And really identifying where is the actual issue? Um, many times companies think they have a marketing problem and it is not a marketing problem. And they try and hire an agency or they try and spend 25K a month on LinkedIn ads and it's just not, it's solving the wrong problem. Feel free to re-listen to this after. I gave you some different uh, different fodder. If you're like committed and in for that that company, like it sounds like it's a smaller company. It feels like some of those responsibilities even outside of your job description, like that nobody's doing them and you might be able to take those on and those become... Those are like the foundational skills of an entrepreneur that you could learn while someone else is paying you. Like, how do we understand customers? How do we really identify a need? How do we use our technical ex expertise to develop solutions? How do we test those hypotheses with customers? Um, that's the mode that I'm in right now. I love this mode. It like plays to all of my strengths as an entrepreneur um, and a marketer. So those could be this could be a place where you could learn a lot of those things on somebody else's dime without a lot of the risk if that is interesting to you. Yeah, that, I mean, you're kind of describing where I'm at right now. Um, so it is interesting. And so just one follow up question. Um, so these other areas, which you're picking up on what's accurate, um, where there are these other areas where it may not be like a job description, uh, duty or responsibility that you're fulfilling. Well, so I look at you, and you've got a million things you could do. And right now you're executing this function of SME. Um, how would you pull back the curtain a little bit on how you evaluate those trade-offs on, uh, you know, Chris needs to do or fulfill this function versus one that you would trade off on? Generating attention and education in the market should be the number one priority of every business leader through and through. If nobody knows about you and nobody pays attention to you, there's no way they can be interested in your product. There's no way they can even have a sales call. There's no way that it can lead to sales. The number one priority and it's been doing it since I, even before I started my own business, I did this inside of companies where I would basically like chauffeur the SME to do the things that I do right now because I didn't have the subject matter expertise starting in 2016. And then when I started my company, very committed that instead of paying someone to make cold calls, that I'm going to take meetings for people that don't want to buy, I'm going to produce information, I'm going to attract attention, it's going to generate interest, it's going to allow people to independently buy my solution. And then I'm going to be able to close those deals faster, more efficiently than in another engine. And so that's it's it's really the business strategy around that and the commitment from either the founder, CEO and or the entire executive team that having attention around your business and the things that matter to your target customer is the number one priority always. Um, and then at a sidebar, I spend 10, 15 percent of my working hours on this and get the benefit of potentially 25 to 50 employees from the impact of SDRs and other marketing people and the outsource, like the all the other ways that companies spend money to generate the interest. I just believe that mine is way more effective and way more cost of cost efficient at the same time. Um, and I think it can work for any business and for any buyer. Sure, the channel might be different. Maybe you put the content on TikTok or on YouTube instead of on LinkedIn. The micro is different, but the top level strategy of generate attention in places that have scalable reach and awareness, and then use that scalable reach and awareness to have people funnel down in interest and get into your long form shows, your podcast, attend this webinar and things like that, which then will lead to people having word of mouth and being in a community and say, hey, I was just at that guy, Chris Walker's webinar. He had a couple of interesting things on our RevOps. And somebody says, yeah, where is customer? We love him. And all of a sudden, they're they're interested in buying, and I haven't even talked to them yet. Um, and so that really is it's about it's about recognizing and truly admitting for yourself how your customer buys, not what you see in multi touch attribution, not what it's about acknowledging how they actually buy. Um, and when you acknowledge that, the path of doing many of these things and investing four hours of my week on this becomes super easy and super simple. Cool, got it. Yeah, you gave me a handful of avenues to go down, so I appreciate that. Right on, man. Well. Keep going. Keep us posted. Sometimes it's a it's a longer. When I've been at uh, when I've had my career breakthroughs uh, before I before I started my own company, it was always at companies where 
there was a lot of friction. And in the first six months I was there, I wanted to leave. And then I stuck it out for two, two and a half, three years. And I had a meaningful transformational change in the company that made a tangible impact. And I had a process and a story and experience and getting through that friction that really gives you the stuff that you need to keep progressing in your career. So I would encourage you to think about that as you think about what's, uh, you know, what your plan is at this in this particular situation. Right on. Um, great way to end too. appreciate the, that. Qu that question was not very much of a tangent, although you hedged, but that was a, gr a great way to end. Um, appreciate you all being here. Great dialogue. Uh, good to see some old faces back again. Um, I'm consistently thinking about uh, the time slot and a couple of other things in this event. It seems like this time is working for some, but maybe not many. So I'm going to continue to think about that as an option. Um, if you have feedback on that, just feel free to shoot me in the DM. We've thought about going, to, actually, we're doing that a little bit earlier on Thursday. We have an event uh, that's sponsored by Refine Labs at, with Alice DeCourcy, the CMO at Cognizum. Um, and that's at 10 a.m. Central Time. So that gives people in Europe and EMEA a more favorable time uh, to potentially attend, but it's a little bit of a drawback on the Pacific Coast. So um, we're going to try and continue to produce the content and the show at, at time slots that work for the most people. So again, appreciate you all being here. Hope you learned something today. Hope you took something away. Hope to see you again next week and uh, have a great rest of your week. See you soon, everyone. Mm -hmm.